Amen. It's good to be breathing. Have a good roof over your head, clothes on your back, place to eat. Amen. Amen. I got a lot to be thankful for tonight. I do. God's been better to me than anybody. Amen. I mean, <laughs> did you hear what I said? <laughs> All right. Well, hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm glad I'm here. I haven't been in the pulpit for a while. And uh, Linda said to me, said, are you ready to get back up in the pulpit? I said, you better believe I am. Amen. <laughs> if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Job. Job chapter 1. Verse 1. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. That man was perfect, upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. Bless your word, Lord. Bless your word. Amen. You can be seated. The best way to understand a book, especially one like the book of Job, is to try to put yourself in that culture at that time. Folks, when the Lord was here 2,000 years ago, the book of Job was 2,000 years old almost. The book of Job is contemporary. Job is a contemporary of Abraham, who's about 1,900 B.C. Abraham had a priesthood that he, he uh, paid tithe to, and his name was Melchizedek. Melech Sedek, he's the king of righteousness, is what that name means. Melech in Hebrew is king. Sedek is righteous. So he's the king of righteousness. The Bible says, truly the less is blessed to the greater. And how many of you know which one blessed which one? Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Yes, he did. He's a mysterious figure. We read of him in the book of Hebrews, and we aren't sure exactly. There's a lot of controversy about whether he was born like a human being or he should just showed up here. But the bottom line is that Melchizedek was a very special individual and he was here before Israel ever had a priesthood. They spent 400 years in Egyptian bondage and when they came out of that Egyptian bondage, God had them build the tabernacle. Think of all the time that before that there was no tabernacle. 1,400 years before Christ is the time, is the time of Moses He's 500 years after Abraham, and all the way from the, built, from, the, from the creation of Adam to the time of Moses, there existed no tabernacle on this earth. There existed no Aaronic priesthood on this earth, and there existed no written scripture on this earth. So the priesthood fell to the individual of the home, the chief father of the home. He was the priest of the home, and he represented uh, that home before God and stood instead before God for his people this is what Job was. This is what Abraham was and of his day. And so what we have happening here to us in the book of Job chapter number one is a confrontation that takes place on three levels. Three levels. Level number one is God Almighty himself. The Bible said he worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. He doeth all things according to his will. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so is he higher than us. There is no way that you'll know what God says. You can't find him out unless he reveals himself. This is why the Lord Jesus Christ said it's so important. Because if you reject Christ, you reject the Father. You can't have the Father without the Son. And the Lord Jesus Christ made it very clear that no man knows the Father but the Son. No man knows the Son but the Father. And whom the Son will reveal. The Lord Jesus Christ therefore must reveal the Father. And there's no way in the world tonight that we'll know what happens there. One of the great mysteries that any physician has is when he's working on a human body and that body dies. Life leaves that body. He has his instruments and, uh, you know, flat line on, the, EK, on the, uh, the heartbeat and so forth. He has certain things that he measures to, make, uh, to determine if he has a dead body. But as far as determining and defining the life of that individual, there's not a soul walking the face of this earth that can tell you what the essence of life is. But the truth of the matter is that the Father, Lord God Almighty himself, is the essence of life. 
Everything about him is life. His word is life. His look is life. His touch is life. His being is life. His presence is life. When he sent his son into this world to, do, to go to a cross and die, he gave us a form of life that we had never known until the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins. So therefore what happens is the son will reveal to creation, which is us, all creation, he will reveal the father in his essence and in his glory. And only the son can do that. It's not so much a matter of finding the Father, it's a matter of reaching to the Father. And my friend, it's important tonight to understand this. What you're reading here in the book of Job, chapter number one, is when Satan appears, we read about him later on in the same chapter. The Bible says they came and presented themselves before the Lord. You'll read it down there and, uh, in verse number six. The sons of God, Satan was with them. He presented himself before the Lord as the Lord manifested himself to his creation. That's important to understand. That's important. All you know tonight of the Father is what you know of the Son. You can't know more. There is no way. There is no way. And as I've said a thousand times, we do not know the essence of a spirit. There is no way. There is nothing to measure that with. And God is a spirit. He's a spirit being. And the truth of the matter is that you are a spirit being tonight. You're a spirit. And you have a soul and you live in a body. Your body's wearing out. Mine is anyway. And one day you'll give it up and it'll be finished. And it's only good for a few decades. And it's, it's done its job. It's finished. It's over with. But my spirit is eternal. There's no end to it. There's no end whatsoever. And this is the life that God gave me because God is life. And in him is no darkness. And in him is no death. And so when we find in the book of Job, this highest level, we find God himself with his own purposes for what's happening in the book of Job. The second level you'll find in the book of Job is where God confronts his creatures. And among the creatures, you'll find Satan. Satan, he says to him, where you been? He's been walking to and fro on the earth, walking to and fro. This is where Satan had been. Now, Satan's a spirit being. Now, someone says today, well, the devil's worn me out today. He's in France. But another one in Germany says, well, the devil wore me out today, too. Well, we've got a few folks over here in America that said the devil wore them out today, too. So can the devil be in more than one place at a time? Only God is omnipresent. That's a big word. It simply means that God can be everywhere at the same time. One of the reasons he can be everywhere at the same time, he's a spirit being. So what about Satan? Does Satan <laughs> zip around, goes from one to the next at the speed of light? Or is Satan capable of being in more than one place at a time? It's quiet in here, and I want you to think, because this is important. You're dealing with a spirit being that is far, far above a man right now, far above you. And God uses this spirit being. If you'll notice, the confrontation was initiated by God, not Satan. God said to Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? Now, I consider the fact that God called him a servant. And then we enter in through 42 chapters of the book of Job. And then what happens at the end of it? He called him a servant. If you'll remember Job, Daniel, and there's another one there. Anybody remember his name? Three men mentioned the Old Testament because of their righteousness. Noah, Job, and Daniel. They're mentioned in the book of Ezekiel twice. They're mentioned because their righteousness stands out above all the righteousness of everyone that ever walked the face of this earth. But when you begin to study the book of Job, you find out that Job was not a perfect man. Now, it starts by saying he was, and this is the observation of who he was to the people who knew him and where he was. But you see, here's the problem. Once you come in contact with God, once the Almighty begins to move into your life, everything changes. Everything changes. And this is where God Almighty cannot be replaced. He can't, you can't, with something else, you can't, you can't make a, you know, you can't make a substitute or anything of that nature. It's either God or nothing. And so Satan is being used in the book of Job. Now Satan has his purposes and he has his motives. He has his message. As a matter of fact, if you read the Bible, you find out the devil preaches more than once. He says to the Lord in the book of Job, he said, skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for his skin. Well, did you know that if you go out and ask the average American, 
and, can, and look at his life and see how he lives, you'll find out that 99.9% .9 of the time that's absolutely true. But it's not absolute. Because there are people who will lay their life down for the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So it is a principle, and it's the kind of principle that Satan uses, skin for skin. All that a man hath will he give for his skin. When Psalm chapter number 91 was quoted to the Lord in the wilderness, he quoted the Bible. He quoted it verbatim. Satan knows the scripture. Wonder why he reads it. You ever wonder why? You ever wonder why? You ever wonder why Satan reads from the book of Genesis at that time through Malachi? You ever wonder why? Because Satan knows there's power in the word of God. He knows there's power in it. He said, he shall give his angels charge over thee, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. It is written, he said. It is written. But what did the Lord do? He applied it and interpreted it. That's where wisdom comes in. It's one thing, like an encyclopedia, to quote scripture and throw it all over the place. You hear that all the time. You hear scripture quoted here, scripture quoted there, here, there, here, there. All the places the scriptures quoted, 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 quoted. Well, my, any computer can do that. Any machine can do that. But wisdom comes from God. The truth of the matter is the one who wrote the Bible is the only one who can really interpret the Bible. The Holy Spirit's the only one who can open up the Bible to your heart. If you find yourself stumped on a scripture and, you, and, you've, and, you've, and you've claimed it, as you've heard people say, that I don't know that necessarily there's anything wrong with that, but you've got to be careful. You read a scripture, you say, this scripture is speaking to me, this is my scripture, I'm going to hold on to this and nothing's going to move me from it, I'm going to hold on to this is it. And you're satisfied that that is a promise directly to you and nothing can change that. But the truth of the matter is the only way that you'll ever really know what the will of God is in your life is by the working of the Holy Spirit. He's given us his spirit. And the Holy Spirit will enlighten us to his word. That's why he came into the world. He said he will guide you into all truth. Truth. You'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. So when we have the book of Job, we find out on the second level, the second level, we find out that there's a confrontation between Satan and God. And God uses Satan, and he still uses him. Now you'll learn a lesson when you hear people say, well, the devil made me do it. Anytime you hear somebody talking like that, be very careful. You're dealing with somebody who is refusing to accept responsibility for their own problems and their own sins. The devil didn't make you do it. The devil might have laid a, a temptation in front of you. He might have, but he didn't make you do it. Every man has sins when he's led away by his own lust and enticed. That's right. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You ever thought about what sin is? You ever thought about, really thought about what it is? Somebody said, well, it's transgression. It's missing the mark, this, that, coming up short and all that. Well, these little definitions are okay as far as they go, but they don't go very far. What is sin? What is the real essence of sin? Sin is a spiritual thing. Note carefully. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Did you realize that when you say something, send it out into the world, that you've created something from your mouth? That is, you've given life to it because sin goes forth, whether it be gossip or whether it be, whether it be adultery or whether it be anything of that nature. And it's not going to stop until it is stopped by the power of the Holy Spirit of God applying the blood covenant to it? That's right. So if you do it and you don't confess it and you don't get it right with God, it's like a cancer that continues to work. That ought to be something to give us some thought. Yeah, it ought to give you some thought. You see, Job is said to be a uh, perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. But we find out, if you'll turn to the book of Job, chapter number 31, we find out that uh, an issue comes up. The 31st chapter of Job. Job has three friends, if you want to call them friends, <laughs> who come to comfort him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they, his three friends, they, they come to comfort him. And of course, they are no comfort. He called them miserable comforters. <laughs> but you see, they represent religion. Different aspects, different takes on religion. Different interpretations. They all made their applications. And every one of them, when they were finished, chapter number 32 and verse number 3, here's what happened. 
also against his three friends was his wrath kindled because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. See that? It says they condemned him. Now when the Bible talks about condemnation, it's not talking about simply conviction. In the Bible, condemnation means that judgment has been passed and with it, the punishment. And you've been brought to the point where you will pay whatever you need to pay for your sin. And they had condemned him. Yet they didn't have a clue what they were talking about because they didn't even know what was happening. You see, on the third level, the third level is what we're coming down to now. First level is God alone, himself. Second level is God and Satan. And the third level is mankind, humanity. It's human wisdom. It's human observation. It's human ability. And there's so much that passes itself for the word of God in the church. There's nothing in the world more than human experience. Folks, don't ever judge my, your life or my life or anybody else's life by human experience. There's something much greater than that. That's the word of God. Look what he says in Job 31. Verse 1. I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? For what portion of God is there from above? And what inheritance of the Almighty from on high? He's beginning to, this is what's called uh, introspection. He's looking inside himself. Verse 3. Is not destruction to the wicked a strange punishment to the workers of iniquity? Doth not he see my ways and count all my steps? In plain words, why am I suffering like this? I'm not one of the wicked. See? Now go down. Verse 5. And count all the ifs in the 31st chapter of Job. If I have walked with vanity. Verse 7. If my step hath turned out of the way. Verse 9, if mine heart have been deceived. And so we go to verse 13, if I did despise the cause of my manservant. Verse 16, if I have withheld the poor from their desire. Are you getting the picture here? Look at all these ifs. I don't know of a chapter in the, in the whole Bible that's got more ifs in it than this. You say, well, Job was clearing himself and trying to get right with God. Oh, no. Anytime someone says to you, if I have done such and such, uh, please forgive me for it. That's not confession. That's not repentance. There, there's nothing in that. No, 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 no. You will confess it. You will say, I did you wrong. Or I said the wrong thing. Or I have done wrong. Not if I have done wrong. You see. But this is what happens in the 31st chapter of the book of Job. Now, he, the, a lot of this is an answer to uh, uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. These are his three friends. But there's a fourth one that shows up. And you'll notice this fourth one when he shows up, chapter number 32. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. Now, God has to bring us to the end of ourselves before, the, before he can really begin to talk to us. Otherwise, our conversation with God is intellectual instead of from the heart. And how many of you know in life, you've lived enough of life where you talk to people, you deal with people, even yourself, where you really realize when the heart begins to speak? You know what I'm talking about? There's nothing like the heart that begins to speak. Because when a person speaks from the heart, they really don't care what people think. They don't care what they say. They don't even care what they look like. They're burying their soul. All right? And so Job has said to these uh, three who have condemned him of every religious thing they can. They said, you're a sinner. And why we, the only reason you're suffering like this is because you've done some hidden thing. And they had all the answers, yet not a one of them had an answer. So what was the point in all this? The point in this was for God to make himself known to Job in a way that Job was never, ever, ever had known God before. And I want you to come down with me toward the end of the book. Job chapter number 42. 
if in one message, there's no way in the world you can cover all this stuff. But I want to call your attention to chapter number 42. And Job is brought to this point. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? We like to counsel. We like to talk. The Bible says a fool is known by a multitude of words. That's right. Be very careful with somebody who has all the answers. Be very careful with them. Be very careful. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. He sees what God wants him to see, but that's a good step forward. Because when you begin to see in Scripture, sight means that you are becoming accountable for something. A major transformation takes place in Job in the 42nd chapter here of the book of Job. Notice what he says. Look at this. He said, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Notice carefully. Job is not repenting of sins. Once you, get, once you get into the business of sins, you get into a minefield, okay, that'll destroy you. Because if all you think the service of God is your sins, you'll never get to the bottom of your sins because you're sinners. And there's not a perfect man on the face of this earth. There's not a man in this house or listening to my voice and breathing tonight that is sinless, Right? Now this brings us back to the fellowship of 1 John chapter number 1. You must absolutely accept God's method of fellowship and anointing and power in your life. He said, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now how many tonight would say, I agree with what Job said. His observation of himself was true and correct. I agree with that because if I were brought into the presence of the Lord, I'd do the same thing. I would abhor myself, and I would repent in dust and ashes. What? I would be overwhelmed with his holiness for one thing. I'd be overwhelmed with his glory for another. I would be overwhelmed with the one who can see through me. He can see inside me like I can't see within myself. And God is gracious to us because he doesn't, he doesn't allow his holiness to consume us. He's a good God. He's a gracious, long-suffering, merciful God. Amen. Amen. He's good to us in the sense that he gives us a buffer zone where he's able to communicate with us and we can walk with him and we can fellowship with him and we can have peace with him. And that buffer zone is a person. And there's only one, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. Not religion, not your church, not your fellowship, not your hard work, not you know, your dedication, consecration. That's not your buffer zone. And that's not your access to the Father. There's only one, and it's a person, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, therefore, I abhor myself. Now, you have these preachers in the pulpit telling people to love themselves. I cannot tell you tonight what a disgusting thing that is for a person to get up in the pulpit and tell you to love yourself when the Apostle Paul made it plain. In the last days, men shall be lovers of of their own selves, covetous, boasters, so forth and so on. And compare that with a man who lived 1,900 years before Christ. I abhor myself. Now look at this. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for you have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my, watch this, servant Job hath. Now the Lord did not withhold himself from speaking to Job. He convicted him. He brought him low. He laid it at his door. But notice what he calls him now. He said, he's my servant. This is my servant Job. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering 
and my servant Job shall pray for you. Did you see this? For him will I accept. See that? Here's your priest. Here's the go-between. Here's the priesthood. You see, this is long before Aaron ever lived. This is 500 years before Aaron was ever born and the Aaronic priesthood was established. Job is a priest. He said, I will accept him. That's what the high priest is when he goes into the Holy of Holies. He alone is accepted for all the people. That one man, the high priest of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he entered into the presence of the Father, he alone was accepted. Christ was accepted for all mankind. He said, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like, notice he calls him again, my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and so far the, Na the Naamathite went, and did according as the Lord commanded them, and the Lord also accepted Job. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends, also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Notice how that word prayed shows up in the book of Job. Don't you think that's quite remarkable? Prayer. He prayed. Uh, had Job talked to the Lord before this? Did he talk to him before this? He said, he's talking to him. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything. He's talking to God. But it doesn't call it prayer. In the book of Job, chapter number one, Satan's talking to God, but it doesn't call it prayer. If you take a step further with Satan, he's incapable of prayer. Satan is incapable of a lot of things, and prayer is one of them. The truth of the matter is, as I've told you before, only the man is capable of prayer. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world 2,000 years ago, he came into this world praying to God the Father. There's not a word where it says he prayed to the Father ever before he was incarnate as a man. It wasn't until the Lord Jesus Christ was incarnate as a man. Once he became a man, then he prayed to the Father. There's one God and one mediator between God and men. Who? The man, Christ Jesus. This is why prayer was a major part of his life. So what is prayer? Well, it's a spiritual thing for one. No question about that. But in the Bible, prayer in the book of Job seems to be a place of intercession. Notice that he's praying for someone. But it's not always simply intercession because Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Father and God added 15 years to his life. There's a number of places throughout the Bible where men pray. So what is the difference between prayer and talking to God? Isn't that something? Now, I want you to think about that tonight when you go home. Why isn't, if you're just talking to God, is it not prayer? And if you talk to him the right way, it is prayer. He, his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. You remember that? Teach us to pray. All right, in Matthew chapter number 6, here's what he said. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you'll take that and break it down into its elements, you'll find out that he's telling God that he's sovereign. He's telling God that his name is above every name. He's telling God that he is completely and totally dependent upon him for the very breath he breathes. He's telling God that he is accountable to creatures around him to forgive them. And he's telling God that there is no hope in this world, that he's looking for him to come and bring his kingdom with him. And then he's telling God that his glory is above all there is, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now that's what's in it. And that's, what we, that's to me, I, I, I pray it every day, practically. Every once in a while I might miss a day, but I pray that prayer all the time. One of the reasons I pray is because the fundamental Baptist told me not to, so I thought, all right, that's exactly why I'm going to pray it. <laughs> that's the way I'm made. That's how I'm wired. <laughs> yes, sir. And you know what? God has blessed me in that. 
Now, here's what happens. Let's just be honest with you tonight. I want to be as personal and honest as I can be. I can sit out there on that deck, and I've got the woods behind me. I've got my woodpecker pecking on a tree over here. I've got the robins flying by it. I've got, the, I've got, a, I've got a, a, a dove. You can hear that dove off at a distance. And I'll sit out there, and I'll look up to heaven, and I'll talk to God. It's just words sometimes. But then sometimes my heart really begins to move. It really does. It really begins to move. My heart really begins to move. Not always. I'm not super spiritual. I'm not super spiritual. I'm not up here trying tonight to tell you, you know, that I walk around with a, with a halo and, and all the rest of that. No. I'm just like you. There's a lot of stuff about me sorry and low down. The old man's still there. He's alive. He's fighting for dominance. But I do, on occasion, folks, I feel a presence come upon me that is not of this world. It's not of this world. And when it does, then I really begin to pray in a sense that, it's, that I didn't start praying. What's that? I begin to intercede. I mean, when, I, when you feel that presence of God come upon you, then I start praying for the sick folk in our church. Then I start lifting up names before God. Then I start seeking him, drawing nigh to him in my heart and in my soul. I'm not saying I'm good. Not at all. If you knew me, you'd know that. And I'm not saying I'm super spiritual. But I am saying this. If that was taken away from me, I don't know what I'd do. Because that's a time of fellowship. That's a sweetness. That's a goodness. That's a time when I know there's something going on that is above me. You know it. You sense it. You feel it. And it's not emotion. It's not just feeling something emotionally. It's deep, deep down inside the soul. And many times I have simply said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And I'd get about that far into it, and I could tell this is going to be different. <laughs> can you ever do that? I can tell it's going to be different. You can tell. A spirit begins to move upon you. Words are words and prayer is prayer. And there is no substitute for prayer. And if you ever have something like this, and oh, how desperately we need it, it will completely change your Christian walk with God because you'll know he heard you. And you'll know he's there. And you'll know he'll bless you. And you'll know you'll have fellowship. And truly our fellowship was with the Father and with his son. And I never know what's going to happen. I don't, have a, I don't have a list, in other words. You know how some folks, they have a prayer list. And there's nothing wrong with prayer list. You want to make sure you get it covered. You've got the names and all. That's all fine. Good night. I'm not criticizing that. But sometimes you get in there and you start praying. And he'll start bringing things to your mind you didn't even think about. He'll have you start praying about things and about waves, about, about how he's going to do something in something. He'll, he'll begin to move in your heart and, and he'll say, now I want you to pray about this. You pray about that. He said, I'm getting ready to do this. Now you pray about that. And I start praying about it. And oh, how he blesses. And you pray more and you pray more and you pray more. Have you ever gone into a closet and shut the door, turned the lights out and for 30 minutes later you came out or an hour later you came out of the closet and you lost time while you were in there? You ever done that? You see, this is a privilege he gave man. This is ours. This is us, folks. This is for us. No angel, no cherubim, no seraphim, none of these things. As far as the Bible teaches and says, there's none of them that can pray, but we can. It's almost as if God made a man to put him in a place to where God can communicate with that man and reveal himself to that man in a way that nothing else can. Did you know why God made us? You know what the Bible says he made us? Why he made us? To enjoy him. Now, I know we sing about a mansion on a hilltop. And that's all fine. But I don't care how big your mansion is, and I don't care how much gold you got hanging on it, and I don't care how much silver you have. Sooner or later, that'll start to lose its luster. But he never will. Amen. He made us to enjoy him. And when I think about the redemption, how far he went, how low he came, what he did, so that he could find me and save me and bring me up 
to where he is. We are made a little lower than the angels. Christ was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. But the day will come when we will judge angels above them, above them. You can walk where angels cannot walk now. You can talk where angels cannot talk now. You can experience God in a way that angels cannot experience him. You're a man, mankind, male, female. Ish in Hebrew, ish ah. Ish in Hebrew, man, ish ah, woman. Aleph is all they did is add the aleph to the ish. And it's male or female. Mankind. Called their name, Adam. They. Talking about mankind, male and female. In a way that nothing else can. And Satan's job throughout all the Bible, every time he ever shows up, is to mess you up with God. He doesn't have to tempt you to fornicate. He doesn't have to tempt you from drugs or falling down drunk. He doesn't need to tempt you to do that. Your flesh is full of it. He wants to intervene. He wants to come between you and God because he knows once you ever have that happen to you, you will develop a hunger that will never be satisfied. Never, ever. Once God has ever blessed your soul and fed you of his presence, once he has ever touched you from on high, and once that's ever happened to you, you will never be satisfied with anything of this earth again. You will have nothing but contempt for religion, but you will never, ever not be satisfied with Christ. Now I'll finish with this tonight. I got plumb off of my notes. Sorry, notes. We'll get you again sometime. When you go into the Holy of Holies, the high priest went in there and you had, you had the Hilasmos, is what it's called in the book of Romans, the mercy seat, the place of propitiation. All right, you have, a, you, have a, you have the Ark of the Covenant with a seat of mercy, gold, pure gold. Inside that was a table of stone written by the finger of God, a pot of manna that fell down from heaven. And then what was that third thing? That's right. I'm glad to see y'all listening. Y'all, good night, you're right on it. Aaron's rod that budded, right? This is where God proved Aaron to be his successor, to be the actual point. Anyway. Nobody outside could see what was in there. Not even the high priest could see what was in there. He never opened that. Lord have mercy help us. <laughs> he didn't touch it. The only thing he ever did when he went in there was he was sprinkling blood. <laughs> Hope you accept this blood. And it wasn't the blood of Christ, blood of bulls and goats. Blood was flying everywhere. Blood covenant down on the mercy seat. You know who saw that? God did. That was for God. Table of the law written in stone. Aaron's rod that budded and a pot of manna was for the father to see. And when the father saw it, he smelled a sweet savor. He was happy. He was satisfied. And each one of these three things rise above any human ability because they gave to the father everything he demanded from mankind. When the Lord Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago, he was the perfect man who satisfied God's demand for holiness, perfection, sinlessness, and everything. And the Son gave to the Father all of it that he demanded. Amen. Now, I'm going to go into the Holy of Holies. We have a new and living way. Not a curtain, but we have a new and living way, his flesh. I go into the Holy of Holies. It's not for me to see that. It's for the Father to see it. And he sees his Son. And the Bible says that my life is hid with Christ in God. So here we are. Satan who cannot pray, he can't pray. Therefore, if you don't open your mouth and speak to him, he doesn't know what you're saying. He can't pray. And now your life, your very existence is hidden in Christ in God. Therefore you are accepted in the beloved. 
Well, what if I'm not perfect? There's nothing new with it. Well, what if I don't understand what I'm doing? What's that got to do with anything? Are you a believer in Christ tonight? Then you have a new and living way, and Satan cannot stop you. You can enter into the Holy of Holies between the cherubim, and you can open up to the Father through the Son by the power of the Holy Ghost, and you can come face to face with your Maker as far as you possibly can in this world until the time comes when we see him as he is. Father, bless your word tonight. May we have some folk in this house tonight, Lord, who, who have a hunger. They, they have a hunger, Lord. They know what I'm talking about. Sometimes they've had this and they're just afraid to say it to people because they're afraid of what people may say to them, how they might mock them, make fun of them, call them Holy Joes or something. But it's touched a chord tonight. And they know that they need to be back in there in the Holy of Holies. They know that's where they have their joy. That's no, they know where power is. They know where peace is. They know where forgiveness is. They know what fellowship is. And they want to come back. Help them come back tonight, Lord. You came and died for us. You, you'll bring them. You'll lead them. By the power of the Holy Ghost, every step that needs to be made, you'll bring them back where they need to be. Lord, may you do that tonight. May you do it. May you do it in Jesus' name. For Jesus' sake. And your heads are bowed tonight. Nobody's looking. Let me say this for you. I'm a priest, according to what Peter taught. But so are you. We're a royal priesthood. Therefore, we can offer up sacrifices to God. We have access to the Father. All of this is yours. Don't ever let some person get between you and God. If you'd like to come down here tonight and pray, I'll be glad to get down here and pray with everybody who wants to come down here and pray. We'll have prayer. If you'd like to come down here, we'll pray. And I'll give you a moment or two to just get up, walk down here, and then we're going to have prayer. We're going to talk to the Father. And then when you leave out of this house tonight, you'll leave out better than you were when you came in. Anybody else, you just get down, come down here, and I'll stand up here, and I'm going to pray. I want to pray. That's what this is, prayer meeting. Let's talk to the Lord. Say, preacher, I'm not good enough. No, you're not, and I'm not. Nobody else is, but Christ is. You don't come before the Father. You come in the Son who comes before the Father. Our life is hid with Christ in God. Anybody else like to come down here now with us, and let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you. You know where you found me. You know what I was. Hallelujah to a holy name tonight. You cleansed me. You saved me. You wrote my name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I will thank you and praise you forever, Lord. You've been good to me. You've been far better to me than I ever deserved. It's taken a long time to learn some things, Lord. Stubbornness on my part. Wrong teaching on my, on the, on my part from others. My Heavenly Father, tonight I ask you, teach me, show me. I want to learn. Oh, God, I come as a student before you. I'm hungry for your word, hungry for your presence. I've got to have it, Lord. Other things won't last. It won't last. We have a good service. I'm glad for it. We have good preaching and good fellowship in here. That's all good, and I'm glad for it. But, Father, I can't live on that alone. I've got to have you. I've got to have you. Oh, God. Oh, God. There may be somebody in this house tonight who's just about ready to quit, ready to give up, don't know where to go, stumbling around in darkness, confused. Well, I know this. I know that they've fallen prey to the devil because he is the author of confusion. You're not. Our Father, let him come back to where it started. Just a simple path right back where it all started. Put in their mind where they know that day, they know, they know, they know that something happened in their life that changed them and from that moment on, they knew that they were a new creature in Christ. They knew. Nobody could take that away from them. But Satan has muddled it. He's covered it up. He's tried to, he's tried to destroy it and cause them to believe a lie about it, that it wasn't even real, that it was just an emotion. But in deep down inside their soul tonight, they want you, Lord. Oh, bless them, Father. Oh, bless them. Bless them, my Father. God, I cannot come between them and you. I don't do that, and I not dare not do that. But I can intercede. I can pray for them. I can do that. But we know our Lord Jesus Christ right now, by the power of the Holy Ghost of God, 
is coming before you for all that he did for us, for that great sacrifice that was made for us. Oh, that we might come boldly with confidence, Lord, absolutely assured that you won't turn us away. I'm so glad for that. I'm so glad there's no turning away. You'll receive us. And Father, bless them. If there's sin eating them up, bearing them down, robbing their life, a sin our Heavenly Father tonight that they can't seem to get victory over, it just keeps coming back and haunting them and haunting them. Oh, God, tonight, lead them by the Holy Ghost to the place to where they understand how to deal with that sin, that it's not in their power to break it. It's not in their power to put it away. It's not in the power of a human being to destroy sin. That's not our power. But Christ did at the cross. And for them to get it under the blood and look to you and thank you for what you've done with it and what you will do with it. Bring that sin under the blood and be cleansed of it tonight, my dear friend. Be cleansed of it and accept the cleansing in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Bible says, it washed us from our sins in his own blood. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Cleanse them from it and then give them victory over it and then give them the fellowship that we so desperately need. Bless everyone. Bless them now. Bless their homes, their children, the husbands and wives. Bless them. I pray this in Jesus' name. For Jesus' sake I ask it. Bless his holy, righteous name. Amen. 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 Bless his name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Bless his name. The old Hebrew would say Baruch Hashem. Hashem, the name. Baruch means to bless. Bless the name. Now leave out of here tonight knowing full assurance that he's accepted you and he accepted your prayer. He's accepted you. He accepts you not because of your person. He accepts no man's person. The Bible says he accepts no man's person. He accepted Christ. And if you're in Christ, you got accepted. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We'll start preaching again. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Holy Ghost is in here tonight. Praise God. Amen. Lord willing, if nothing happens, I, I'll be out there listening for my dove in the morning, listening to the woodpecker and uh, some of the birds flying around. Amen. Just listening, watching, praying. Amen. All right, well, I'm done. Maybe if somebody has a special prayer request tonight, I can take that before we...